I would like to introduce uh, myself. My name is, uh, as Nishan already mentioned, Elke, Elke Dahl. I am um, based in Austria and um, at the Center for Social Innovation in Vienna. And I'm coordinating a project uh, together with these wonderful people that we have invited today also as panelists. So there is uh, the Dr. Susanne uh, Kepler-Schlesinger. She is the vice director of the Austrian Academy uh, of the Diplomatic Academy, the Vienna School of International Studies. Uh, there is Dr. Marga Guau Soler. Uh, she is uh, an advisor uh, in many, many functions to a lot of different institutions, actually, in terms of science diplomacy, globally, in fact, uh, working for the World Academy of Sciences, uh, but also as a consultant to UNESCO and other institutions. We have Dr. Lorenzo Melchor. Uh, he is a science advisor on science diplomacy at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, uh, CESI. And we have uh, with us also Charlotte Rungius, who is a German research associate uh, at the German Center for Higher Education and uh, Science Research. So if you have questions that already pop into your mind uh, with the introduction of those people, uh, feel free to uh, already pop them into the uh, question function. Nishan, I think, uh, is it you who is showing the video or is it me? I think you would need to probably take back the floor uh, for the screen share uh, to show our little video, if that's uh, possible. Sure, I'll, I'll share my screen and start the video now. Perfect, that looks good. Here is a riddle for you. The year is 2222. The sky is blue, the oceans are clean. Nobody's going hungry, nobody's burning fossil fuels. How did we get here? Confused? Let's work it out. Rewind to the present. Oh dear, plenty to sort out. Climate change, biodiversity loss, lack of food security, pollution. Who can solve the global challenges of the 21st century? Well, here's a politician. It's her job to decide and implement policies for the benefit of citizens. The solution to global problems is partly in her hands, but she's not an expert in every field. She needs advisors. Look, here's a scientist. She has reliable technical knowledge, and she works to make discoveries and to try out new solutions. But the scientist and the politician still need help to bring countries together. Ah, here's a diplomat. He has international experience and cultural sensitivity. He finds common interests between countries and fosters collaborations. He's also part of the solution if he coordinates his work with others. But wait, there are more. Concerned members of society, activists, intellectuals, business people, each doing their part to shape the future. So, back to our riddle. In the year 2222, who saved us? Only a combination of policy, science, international cooperation and society can solve our global problems. The sum of these efforts is what we call science diplomacy. Together, they form a shared method for bringing society into the best possible future. Science diplomacy is a collaborative and international approach to tackle grand societal challenges. What does this cooperation look like in practice? For example, during a pandemic, scientists produce evidence and recommendations to government officials who must make decisions regarding public health, travel and trade, among other questions. At the same time, diplomats keep open efficient channels of communication which aid the exchange of information between experts across the globe. Now, consider the global action on climate change. Knowledge shared by the world's climate scientists provides diplomats with important evidence to negotiate international agreements to reduce emissions. So, in practice, science diplomacy involves a wide range of activities, combining foreign policy and scientific endeavor. The European Union can be a leader by strengthening science diplomacy to address global challenges. This can be done, for example, by fostering spaces for interaction between scientists, diplomats, policymakers, and society, who must all work together, sharing their influence and expertise. During this process, new professionals must be trained, such as science advisors to governments and science attaches at embassies, to facilitate the exchange of specialist knowledge. 
In the future, when we tell the story of how current global challenges were addressed, we will remember leaders of different countries coming together, taking decisions supported by reliable scientific information. We will look back at the process of science diplomacy. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, and let me move on. Uh, I think you have uh, seen one of our visions of science diplomacy. Uh, there are, of course, more definitions of that. Um, and we're going to shed some light on this and on our vision that uh, and we have tried to embed in this short video uh, and some other aspects of it too. Uh, the, the knowledge presented to you stems in part, uh, for, of course, from the experience of the work that our panelists have been doing uh, in all of their career, but also in a project that is called Using Science for in Diplomacy for Addressing Global Challenges, uh, which we got funded um, with a start from January 2018 in the Horizon 2020 project. Uh, or program, sorry, uh, with a consortium of 10 partners, but actually with a quite wide community that we are expanding continuously. Uh, and we're super happy to have the chance uh, to uh, speak to an audience in Australia, New Zealand. It's uh, the first for our project uh, to reach out uh, to your access. And thanks a lot for this opportunity. Um, the project is a research and innovation action in the program and uh, beyond, um, so the core of this project means that we have nine case studies, it's a social scientific project, and based on these nine case studies, we have then built uh, activities uh, around networking and dialogue and community building. We are discussing a uh, governance framework and the possibility um, kind of like to set some principles uh, in, a, in a way to, for, to find better ways of uh, organizing science diplomacy. We are providing um, practical knowledge resources and training materials uh, for people who would like to also spread the word of science diplomacy. And we are really also operationally implementing trainings um, in the sense we had uh, physical workshops before the pandemic and uh, we had uh, already throughout the years prepared an open online course which is a kind of MOOC and uh, that came in very handy uh, now that we're all a little bit immobile uh, and it's free and it's open and uh, it's basically available around the world uh, us uh, providing uh, several modules on uh, different aspects of science diplomacy so you can check that one out as well if you want um, we understand science diplomacy and our panelists are going to go much more into detail into that uh, on this interface between science, uh, science policy, higher education policy as well, and um, foreign relations, uh, international diplomacy. And we want to highlight with the graph that I'm showing you now, uh, also that there is quite a few stakeholders involved and quite a few instruments that are involved in that, that probably are not always operating under the label science diplomacy. So not every advisory group uh, that uh, exchanges uh, on a transnational basis would call itself uh, a science diplomacy instrument or initiative. But the way we see it is that uh, the processes that inform uh, international diplomacy that then in turn, for example, facilitates joint programming or what your access is doing or these kind of um, promotion activities, showcasing how many reasons there are to collaborate. And I enjoyed very much when uh, Mr. McCluskey said that there are millions of reasons to collaborate. Uh, and that's also how, how we see it. 
uh, and we want to focus on the collaborative aspects of science diplomacy, while we do acknowledge that there is also a competitive aspect, of course. Um, so this, uh, this graph uh, is also, for example, one of the training materials that we have uh, made available uh, open source and uh, we have also, let me see here, uh, this is one that we're currently uh, have been working on uh, to transfer some of our knowledge and, and understanding on science diplomacy on the case of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, also here, analyzing different aspects of science diplomacy with competition and cooperation, with the need for uh, transdisciplinarity that breaks the boundaries uh, within science, and then also uh, to other stakeholder groups and uh, the international organizations and the discussion around WHO, etc. Um, so we, we are uh, coming to a few recommendations uh, from this research. Uh, we try to uh, apply our lessons learned uh, in more depth, in depth about this um, recommendations can be seen in a policy brief that is also provided on our project website. So um, yeah, this is how we are working. Uh, so Perhaps it's a nice time to go straight to the panelists uh, and uh, start uh, having an interesting discussion around uh, science diplomacy and what is science diplomacy for addressing global challenges. Uh, what is a science diplomat? How, if you are interested in doing science diplomacy, uh, how could you get involved in science diplomacy activities, being a researcher? or even how would you seek all the career opportunities in this interesting field. With us, we have uh, Susan Kepler-Schlesinger uh, from the Diplomatic uh, Academy of Vienne. We have uh, Charlotte Rufius, uh, who is one of our research uh, scholars doing science diplomacy research on very interesting topics. Marga Wall, who is a, a science consultant on science diplomacy, uh, widely known, uh, and you have myself, uh, Lorenzo. Uh, uh, I work at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology as a new science advisor and science diplomacy officer. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's go and start uh, with the very uh, first question that we have as the title of our session. What is science diplomacy? And in here, we would like to have uh, two minutes uh, for each uh, panelist to provide th their insights about this topic. And then let's have a little bit of discussion or argument between us uh, before moving to the second question. So Susan, you are the first on my, on my screen. Would you like to enlighten us about what is science diplomacy? What do you understand as science diplomacy? Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, for this introduction. Thank you, Nishant, for organizing this conference. And thank you to Elke for presenting our wonderful S4D4C project. Well, um, dear participants, I would like to um, say hi to you. Good morning from Vienna. When I look out, um, I can see that the sun is rising in Vienna. It's going to be a cool day, and maybe we are even going to have the first bits of snow today. So I would like to start my day with a brief reflection uh, about the common understanding or a possible common understanding what science diplomacy could actually mean. Well, right now we are facing manifold global challenges as it was already uh, shown in the, in the brief uh, movie. We face a really, really bad pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is ravaging all over the globe. We face climate change, widespread hunger and malnutrition, migration, the pollution of the oceans, the pollution of the outer space even. So I just named a few of these challenges we have to tackle. Well, do we need an ironclad uh, definition of science diplomacy? Do we need to spend a lot of time and scholarly discussions um, on the perfect definition of science diplomacy? I don't think so, but 
do we need a common willingness of diplomats and scientists to work together? Yes, I can only answer this questions, question with a resounding yes. Right now, scientists and diplomats uh, should use the tailwind created by these global challenges to sit down, to cooperate, to work together, and to find solutions based on facts and based on reason. And I know from experience that this approach is indeed functioning in many fora, in regional fora, in national, bilateral fora, and on a global level. Can we do better? Yes, I think we have to do better. And it was just a few weeks ago that Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, appealed to world leaders to better cooperate in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. And the motto of his speech to world leaders comprised only two words, two words, science matters. And to me, this is a clear sign, a clear uh, sign that the concept of science diplomacy is recognized by the top level of uh, diplomacy as a very urgent concept and as a timely concept. Back to Elke, I can see her on my screen. Yes, you can. Thank you very much, Susanne. And uh, sorry for being uh, dropping out at the very wrong moment. I, I understand that uh, the team has been taking over smoothly and uh, I think the floor just without me inserting myself much should go on and Maiga, would you like to be next uh, and then it just flows? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you because uh, it's very, Australia is very special for me. I did my PhD um, at the University of Queensland in molecular cell biology. Um, some, you know, lifetime ago, <laughs> feels like, but uh, of course, Australia and New Zealand have a, a very special place in, in my heart. So thank you very much, Araxis and Nishan, for inviting us and, and for allowing me to come back, even if it's for a few minutes or an hour virtually um, to this beautiful part of the world. Um, so I've been working in, in science diplomacy for, for eight years now, and uh, my reflection and what I want to offer you is that this is not a new concept, so it makes a lot of sense to need science and diplomacy together to address global challenges, and Suzanne already has explained the rationale. But the, the challenge before uh, we attempted or started to, to uh, investigate the definition is that if you don't name things, if you don't have words for things, then it's very difficult to study them, to research them, to teach them, to make them operational. So in 2010, two institutions, um, the Royal Society in the UK, which is the, the, the British Academy of Sciences, and the American Association for Advancement of Science in Washington DC, came together to provide the first definition and concept for science diplomacy. And they organized this, the thinking around science diplomacy along three pillars. So first, how science can inform diplomacy in the same way that science informs policies or evidence informs diplomacy. The second would be, the second dimension was uh, science um, for diplomacy, meaning that uh, science can be this language of understanding between nations that are at political strain, for instance. And then diplomacy for science. And that means when the diplomatic system helps advance scientific cooperation, for instance, in, uh, in cases of building large research infrastructures around the world. And so that was the first definition. And as Susanna said, this has evolved over the last 10 years. And it's very, uh, so we have here Charlotte, who's the scholar on, 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 on this exact topic that can tell us more. But the idea is that we are looking for ways to arrive to this common understanding um, to make it operation and to help scientists and diplomats, diplomats have a common framework um, in order to work together and not just um, have it be um, tacit um, understanding and, and they make it more explicit and operation. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Marga. I'm just trying to check uh, if it's just me who has a little distortion in the sound or if it's your microphone that is uh, touching the hair or I, I'm just not sure or if it's on my end again. 
some uh, not so good uh, connection today, really weird. Um, sorry, and me inserting myself again, Lorenzo, sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you, Elke. Thank you, uh, all our attendees uh, over there in Australia and New Zealand. It's a pleasure for us in Sport for Suite to be engaging with you in this exercise today. And uh, we hope uh, to make you a little bit interested in science diplomacy. The very first uh, notion that we need to emphasize is that we need to discriminate between science diplomacy and international science co cooperation. Many people think this is the same thing, but it's not. Uh, international scientific cooperation is when two scientific groups or two scientific institutions uh, from different countries or many dif different scientific institutions from many different countries engage with each other and start collaborating. In science diplomacy, there must always be a sense of international uh, policy system, uh, nation states, uh, international organizations, intergovernmental organizations that are involved in this process. It's no longer uh, a unique communication between two scientific institutions, okay? That's on the one hand. And uh, this makes science diplomacy a transboundary field because it involves different nations talking to each other. It involves uh, different policy realms. Uh, we are not only talking about science policy, we are talking about foreign policy, diplomacy, or even higher education policy uh, comes to the table. There are many different stakeholders on the table. It's not only scientific uh, institutions, it's not only uh, state institutions, governmental institutions or Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but we also have industry sector, uh, NGOs, industry, um, intergovernmental organizations and so forth. And lastly, and it's something that Marga has pointed out, it's also a transboundary field bringing together two professions uh, at once, the scientific profession and the diplomatic profession. And these two belong to different fields, they, uh, they follow different rules, they have different interests at hand and so forth. So the Madrid Declaration on Science Diplomacy which is one of our policy outputs uh, published in 2018, uh, claims that science diplomacy is a series of practices that are right at the intersection or at the interface between, on the one hand, science, technology, and innovation, and the other hand, foreign policy, international relations, and international policy system. Thanks, Lorenzo. Charlotte, would you like to write, come in here? <laughs> yes, thank you for having me here. It's a big honor to speak. Um, I'm actually joining from the same little country called Austria. That sounds to be <laughs> uh, so close to Australia, but it's not. We have snow here already um, in Innsbruck. And um, yeah, I would like to share some research perspectives and insights from the last three years. Um, having tried to investigate science diplomacy from a social science perspective. And I think it's, it's important to mention first that we are, of course, on the same line uh, regarding the rational. I think we all want to uh, strengthen science, the role of science in international relations um, to tackle global challenges. But the question is um, how to operationalize it, as Marga um, already said. Um, so we need to have a deeper understanding of science diplomacy and of its dimensions. And that reveals to be quite complex. Um, so maybe I'm just sharing one insight that we had during the last three years, which is it is helpful, or at least it seems very helpful to, to distinguish between two different analyt analytical approaches um, when it comes to science diplomacy. And one is that we, or most of us, are quite familiar with, it is the essentialist perspective. Um, this perspective boils down to um, coming up with, with categories, with typologies, with, with finding some um, pillars that all together build an idea of science diplomacy. That is um, sort of a creative approach and the AAAS typology um, goes into that. And then there is a second perspective, which uh, we call the reconstructive 
um, perspective. And that perspective is more interested in science diplomacy as a narrative. So it, um, it asks, what are the tacit dimensions? What are the, the basic tenets that um, build the idea of science diplomacy and make us able to talk about it, even though we are not able to pin it down or to, to define science diplomacy clearly. And um, I just want to refer you to uh, a publication that came out in September this year, um, where we um, published our insights from such an analytical, uh, analytical perspective on science diplomacy. And just highlighting one insight um, that also maybe um, sheds a more problematic light on the discourse of science diplomacy, which is that we found that um, the discourse actually is um, somewhat building on the idea of science as um, collective virtues of um, providing a cohesive um, strength or value. And this might be um, true in an epistemic sense, though there is a misinterpretation of scientific values or maybe an overload with expectations of science when it comes to um, science diplomacy. And I think we should be very cautious um, about these tenets and understandings behind it. Thanks, uh, Charlotte. Yeah, I think that uh, it becomes clear that uh, it is still an elusive concept and uh, that even after several uh, years of working, uh, it's still not that we are here to present uh, this is a definition. Uh, and this is not what we set out for uh, even so. And it is an interaction space in which, um, yeah, we can all uh, see that the same, even in a way, the same interaction like uh, me and Charlotte uh, or me and Lorenzo, we are not science diplomacy just merely for the fact that I'm in Austria and he's in Spain. But uh, if I were in the US and he were in Iran, uh, there would probably be uh, already suddenly by the sheer fact of the geography, a different dimension that uh, comes in into our interactions. And seeing these uh, interaction spaces uh, in our case studies uh, was also very interesting. Um, so in the sec second section, uh, we wanted to prompt our panelists a bit uh, to consider the evolution of the concept. Uh, uh, we already heard Marga saying that it's not a recent activity, it's an old activity, but maybe you can delve a little bit more into the air aspect of, uh, of the rebranding of this uh, strategy, um, the elements that have uh, become more important recently, uh, and for example, we just saw yesterday, I think, uh, a big meeting between uh, like the Australian uh, president, like the, the President van der Leyen uh, with Charles Michel from uh, the European Council and Scott Morrison from the Australia, uh, really uh, emphasizing in a, in a meeting that was at least here in Europe, uh, broadcasted by, quite publicly, also the uh, high importance. So I think there are constant developments that we could uh, keep up with, but what would our panelists see as the most important in the previous uh, period that they're observing uh, and, and this kind of evolution? What would you expect also for the future? Uh, should we go a similar round or which of the panelists would like to go first? It would go well, Elke, if you allow me, I'd like to pick up Perfect. and share with you and with uh, all the participants um, my experience uh, as a practitioner in the field of diplomacy and uh, going down memory lane, I can assure you that diplomacy is an ancient concept. It has continuously been evolving over the centuries. And uh, a big, big impact uh, has come around with the digitalization, global digitalization. Um, digitalization has also, of course, reshaped how diplomacy is done and in a very fundamental way. Information nowadays circulates 
much, much faster than let's say 20 or 25 years ago. There are new phenomena like big data, cybercrime, fake news. We have to deal with them also uh, in the world of uh, diplomacy. And uh, as was mentioned in the, in the video uh, at the beginning of this conference, there is a broad range of new actors influencing how diplomacy is done, which ideas should come to the forefront. There are uh, members of the, N the world of NGOs, there are advocacy groups, human rights um, uh, activists, members of think tanks, even goodwill ambassadors like movie stars or um, big companies, transnational companies, which influence uh, global decision making. And I truly believe that scientists have to be part of the game. There certainly is a competition uh, of the brightest minds when it comes to determining the future of our livelihoods. And I can assure you that uh, working together with scientists has been a red threat in my, in my own career. When I started uh, as a very young diplomat in the 90s, um, as a member of the Austrian mission to the United Nations, I was responsible for the questions of uh, population development, migration, international drug control. And uh, I remember when I studied the reports of the SG, there was a lot of scientific information in there and uh, one has to digest all of that. How can you do that? You have to find uh, resources that you can rely upon. And the best resources are always colleagues, colleagues coming from the world of science. And my delegation in many, many cases and instances uh, included scientists when it came to tricky issues. I clearly remember our first global debate um, on um, the issue of the human genome and uh, its influence on the diversity of humanity. That was a topic brought up by the French delegation. The human genome had just been discovered. Very interesting topic, very passionate uh, grounds for, for discussion. And uh, ultimately, uh, these uh, discussions led to an international declaration on the human genome about its limits and, um, and its, its kind of um, uh, context in, uh, with, with human rights. So that certainly um, covered a lot of ground regarding the concept of human rights and the scientific side of uh, what uh, the discovery of the human genome meant. It's just one concrete example where um, within the diplomatic missions and delegations there was a very, very um, uh, lively exchange with scientists what, what this uh, could mean. Um, so I truly believe that science diplomacy is a very important pillar of modern diplomacy and will remain an essential tool for both scientists and diplomats. And let me finish by, by telling you that over the last four years, I have observed that scientists show a very keen interest in diplomacy, that they want to be active players um, in, in the area of uh, diplomacy. And I welcome that. And um, uh, I stand ready uh, for an exchange with scientists and so does uh, the Diplomatic Academy. We have about 200 students from all over the world here in Vienna who wish to uh, be active players when it comes to shaping new international norms. And this is what uh, our education is about. Thank you. Keen on meeting this young generation as well, I'm sure. Uh, Marga, what uh, is your contribution? I will just follow and pick up right from uh, Suzanne. Because I think it's, uh, you know, it's almost been an explosion of interest uh, in science diplomacy that we have seen um, through the last 10 years, right? So we started with these um, more academic definitions that have some challenges um, in a way that they are perhaps seen as too aspirational or too romantic. And that comes from those first um, ideas about science diplomacy being provided by scientists. And, and, and specifically natural scientists or people with a natural science background. And so science, as, as Lorenzo has said, scientists tend to have 
a very, you know, aspirational view because, you know, science is for the common goods, for the benefit of humanity, doesn't have borders, and scientists collaborate from colleagues, uh, with colleagues from all over the world without regard for their, you know, nationality or their religion or ideology. So it is a truly global language that uh, it is a natural thing for scientists to think that problems have no borders and science have no, has no borders. However, when we translate this idealistic view onto diplomacy, there is a kind of clash because diplomacy in the end, it's about national interest. There must be something for a country, for them, right? For themselves. So it is not about just like helping the world and making the world a better place. And that's the kind of rosy narrative that uh, Charlotte and Tim and, uh, and other scholars and Pierre Bruno that I see here, uh, Professor Ruffini is with us, they are writing about right now. So this evolution of the concept has gone from a more academic and science driven and a bit more aspirational to a more pragmatic, practitioner driven, also foreign policy driven. So what is it? A like what are the mechanisms, uh, the instruments from a foreign ministry perspective that can be actionable? So how do we uh, design and implement science diplomacy actions from a foreign ministry perspective? And so we come today to the, to the question of digitalization and, and technology, and that is now driving a global tech race. So there is clearly a very strong competition, uh, comp competitive dimension to science and technology cooperation uh, and, and, and competition as well. So two sides of the same coin. Um, but I will just end by saying that this interest from scientists mostly and also from diplomats but scientists are really kind of attracted to this concept in in in, in massive growth is something that we have to harness and we have to provide the frameworks the instruments the mechanisms the educational pathways for those two worlds to come together and to be able to interact and understand each other so that is i think is the next question about training so i'll stop there and then we'll pick it up I think, Lorenzo, yes, I was just wanting to uh, set the bridge and uh, was muted as well. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, regarding the evolution of the science diplomacy concept, I think that uh, all my three panelist colleagues uh, have already delved uh, on the topic. Uh, it's true that uh, we feel that the wider science diplomacy community always overestimate the role of collaboration. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Charlotte, Tim, uh, Professor Ruffini, they have studied different national approaches and also how science attaches or science counselors operate uh, at our embassies abroad. And they are striving to compete for resources in the global market of science, technology and innovation. Those resources are uh, talent, uh, talent circulation, brain drain or brain gain, whatever. Uh, attracting tech industry, uh, and even uh, there are new approaches in the diplomatic corps to allocate or appoint tech ambassadors, diplomats who are uh, deployed to tech uh, hubs uh, like uh, Silicon Valley instead of uh, the capital city of another nation state. So all these approaches uh, strive to seek uh, competition, but uh, and maybe collaboration, right? It's true that we in S4D4C are all up for multilateralism and obviously solving global challenges via science diplomacy. Uh, and we know that those global challenges like uh, ozone layer, it was uh, 20 years ago, or the climate crisis, or even the current pandemic and many other global challenges that are looming there, they all have science, technology, and innovation solutions that require diplomatic agreements for policy implementation in many different countries. Okay, well, that sounds very collaborative, but the truth is that those countries that will invest in science, technology, and innovation will be the ones that will develop those solutions. And when they have those sol solutions at, at hand, they will be sitting at the diplomatic agreement table with a predominant position, with, a, uh, you know, a, a science, technology, and innovation is source of economic power, but also of political power for nations to be uh, an, uh, with a predominant role in those diplomatic tables. So it's important to collaborate to address those global challenges, but let's not be naive. I mean, science diplomacy, 
entails competition and competitive approaches, if, uh, well, consider them in a fair game, uh, play also a significant role in everything. Charlotte. I'm just joining in. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lorenzo, for pointing out also the competitive aspects of science and technology in the international arena. And um, I would just like to um, yeah, highlight and strengthen that point and um, also refer to the fact that science diplomacy as a concept is very interesting with regards to the fact that it includes both dimensions from the very beginning from the early 2000s when the concept was created and was strategically used by policy entrepreneurs and um, it always had these two dimensions of cooperation and competitiveness it um, and i think it's Maybe it's ambivalent, it's not even paradox, but it's something very important to keep in mind um, that this concept actually has both dimensions and it depends on the political will and um, it depends on the intentions behind the people who use the concept and how it plays out in the end. Um, the, the concept is that itself is so complex, it covers so many different aspects um, that it also covers all kinds of intentions from a soft power dimension to the idea of tackling global challenges. Um, and therefore, I just would like to mention, it doesn't um, come as a salvation. Having the concept um, doesn't solve anything at, at all. We just have another word, we have another term, we have maybe also new associations, ideas and visions, which is something very important, but still, um, the term itself doesn't solve anything. And maybe just one final um, uh, aspect regarding the evolution, because it's quite uncontested. We know that the concept did not evolve before the 2000s, that um, it evolved around um, Washington DC's policy circles. Um, it was also linked to a clear um, strategy um, in those years. And from there it took off. While we also know clearly that throughout the last centuries, um, we, we could observe activities that we would nowadays label science diplomacy. So there is again the distinction between essentialist and, and reconstructive perspective. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Uh, so we have prepared a third section, uh, which I'm happy to cut a little short if there are a lot of questions which there are at the moment not. So I think we can go on with this third, third section uh, about the science diplomat um, that we have uh, for the final around 10 minutes um, for the panelists to uh, tell us a little bit about who, who they see as a, a science diplomat, uh, the limits that they consider for the definition uh maybe to tell a little bit if their country or their their they have seen uh, a, a specific structure for science diplomacy and then also indeed as marga said uh, a training so if there should be a science diplomat what kind of training should that uh, person have uh I think this has been a very well established uh, round. So may I just go again and ask Susanne to start? Thank you. Thank you, Elke. Yes, I full heartedly agree with Lorenzo, Marga and Charlotte that uh, science diplomacy should not be looked at through rosy glasses. It's not a salvation for all the problems uh, we have to deal with. And um, as for all professions, uh, it is also true for scientists that getting to the top of international decision making, you have to bring along a solid academic institution and educational background, a lot of professionalism, also experience, dedication, and then at the end also iron, an iron constitution because negotiation processes can last over many hours in maybe bad circumstances when air condition is shut off when you sit together with your colleagues in working groups in small rooms maybe the whole night to reach uh, an agreement on on an issue so an iron constitution definitely 
uh, is important uh, to, to reach the top of the crop. So um, there are certain standards uh, regarding professionalism that uh, apply to, to, to many professional uh, profiles. How do you become uh, a science diplomat, a diplomat or a scientist um, who advises foreign ministers or presidents? Well, as I mentioned in another conference, many ways lead to Rome. Um, I think you should start with an academic education at a university and then later on try um, to start uh, making experiences as an intern, be it in a diplomatic mission, in a ministry, in a think tank or an international organization. And with these experiences, then you can later uh, start uh, to be to become fully active uh, on a regional or maybe even an international level. Regarding uh, my own country, Austria, uh, our ministries, and first of all, the Austrian Foreign Ministry, um, have devoted considerable human and financial resources over the last years um, in science diplomacy. A few years ago, two offices were opened in uh, Washington um, and in Beijing, and a third one in the Silicon Valley called the Office of Science and uh, Technology. It's a collaborative um, initiative financed by the Ministry of Innovation and Research and Education and the Foreign Ministry. These three offices are uh, led in a uh, by, by diplomats, by my colleagues, but uh, the team, of course, uh, the teams are, are also comprising scientists, um, tech uh, diplomats, and people um, working in the area of, of uh, business. So these collaborative teams try to bring science diplomacy to the forefront, and of course, with a certain interest, uh, regarding the Austrian world of science and business. So yes, I also agree with my colleagues that you have national interests to defend and the more knowledge you have, the better networks, the better you can defend your national interests. And I think uh, this is a very important part also uh, in the diplomatic world. So I can only encourage young scientists um, to study how diplomacy is done, how international negotiation uh, processes work and I can only encourage young diplomats or students aspiring to become diplomats to come along with a solid academic, maybe even scientific education and always reach out to the scientific community when it comes to global decision making. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Susanne. Uh, the other panelists, I would ask you to be very short because I am supposed to give back the floor to Nishant in about uh, five to six minutes. Okay, I'll be very short. I think it's now the time to say that the training and the building capacities in science diplomacy is one of the big pillars of our S4D4C project. So it's the time to invite you all to take the online course that we have prepared, the European Science Diplomacy online course that is free, and it really gives both scientists and diplomats its first introduction into this into this space. So uh, probably the link will come up soon. I'll, I'll just look for it and <laughs> put it in there. All right, thank you. And so that, that's a very you know practic practical and actionable um, advice that we have for you in terms of uh, training. So just, you know, in 30 seconds to say that science and diplomacy are very different worlds and uh, those two worlds are siloed um, have been siloed for 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 most of their history um, from the an education and a, and a professional perspective which means that it is not natural that scientists and diplomats will cross paths unless there is an intentional structure that brings them together and so that's what i've dedicated big part of my work my career to to studying and to trying to develop helping countries come up with uh, fellowships, with uh, internships and mechanisms that bring scientists into the policy world. This is very well established in, in many uh, countries in the global north, the United States, Canada, the UK, Europe, also in Australia, you have uh, some of these mechanisms, uh, Japan, but uh, in the global south is still, so most of the countries in the world still don't have those uh, connection mechanisms.
to uh, really expose these two worlds to each other. So it's about training. So of course, transferring knowledge about um, you know negotiations and and public policy, but also doing this experiential learning in which you can understand how the other uh, world works in order to to learn to navigate it and work uh, together with the other community. Yes, very quickly. Um, we, we have talked about what is science diplomacy uh, and the last minutes uh, and go for what is a science diplomat. So uh, science diplomats could be widely defined as those professionals, be they scientists or diplomats, who work to place science, technology and innovation as an important dimension in the international policy system or in the international relations, in the international discussion. Uh, and uh, I would dare to, uh, you know, sort two groups of people dedicated to science diplomacy. One is the group of the institutionalized positions, the professionals who 24 seven are science diplomats. These are the real science diplomats. They wear the, uh, the clothes of a science diplomat at national embassies or uh, national representation abroad in uh, uh, intergovernmental organizations like uh, the World Health Organization, OCDE, and many other, or science diplomats in ministries of foreign affairs. These, all of these may be science counselors, science attaches, science advisors to uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or the special ambassador for science diplomacy or tech ambassadors. These are people who work uh, on science diplomacy all day long. Then we have the non-institutionalized positions in which we would allocate uh, from scientists who from time to time they engage in international discussions providing uh, scientific advice to uh, diplomatic bodies like for instance uh, every year uh, with the COP summit uh, for the climate crisis we've got scientists providing scientific evidence they are doing science diplomacy at that precise moment but then they go back to their lab bench and they keep being scientists regular scientists and we would also say all that variety of consultants policy officers policy scientists who strive to uh, to bring uh, up to the international level the activities of research centers universities or even companies but those uh, are uh, well uh, uh, a topic or a role that sometimes is engaged with science diplomacy. But uh, it, there is a risk of conceptual stretching when we mention that everyone could be a science diplomat. Okay? And having said that, there is no clear career path. All those positions that are institutionalized are very difficult and depend on the uh, national system. Every country has its own way to deploy scientists to embassy or diplomats to embassies with a scientific portfolio. And there is a clear need to acquire more knowledge. If you are a scientist and you are interested in uh, working on science diplomacy, we would encourage you two things. One is get yourself exposed to policy environments, policy cycles, uh, get a policy fellowship of the ones that uh, Marga has mentioned. Or second, second advice is uh, go back to university and take your own master to expand your knowledge on international relations or public policy making because uh, you may be a PhD and maybe an expert in molecular biology but believe me you know nothing about international policy system. Uh, thanks Lorenzo. I think uh, Charlotte the final word now uh, goes to you and we are closing the event with these and invite everyone uh, to join us on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, drop us an email, um, whatever. And then we hand over to Nishant as well. Charlotte. Thank you. I will be very short. And yeah, who is a science diplomat? Um, I think Lorenzo just outlined the normative answer to that. Um, but we also have raised the question in an empirical sense. And we sent out an online survey in 2018 um, to those that we considered potential science diplomats and asked them about um, their duties and their self-identification. Um, we have actually also published um, the results of this analysis in a um, baseline survey 
and a needs assessment. You can find it online. And what's interesting, I just want to highlight one point, is that science diplomacy is easily used and referred to activities and tasks, though less to positions and to professional um, identities. And I think that might be a reason why it's also hard to attract people for trainings and so on, because there is not yet a professional identity called science diplomacy, a diplomat, but there is a lot of activities that we like to refer to as science diplomacy. Maybe I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot. And thanks to the next panel for, um, their, uh, for attending also to us. We will log off and leave the floor to Nishant and the next uh, closing panel. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.